All right, welcome back to The High Rise, a laid-back, data-back conversation about all things cannabis, where we cover cannabis MSOs, Canadian LPs, products, and market analysis. I'm here with Emily Paxia. Hi, everyone. Happy to be back in The High Rise this week. And I'm also here with Matt Carnes. Happy to be here. Laid back, data back, and we go way back. <laughs> That's right. We we do indeed go way back. We do. we do indeed. I don't know how how many years. At least five, six years. Two thousand fourteen, like, uh, I think. I, I mean, that's seven. when I, I, you know, so it's been a while. Well, a lot of I knew of Cy, but he was like a celebrity to me. He was, like, you know, OG. <laughs> but um, but yeah, Matt, you and I, I feel like we we're in this like from the same kind of starting line. Twenty fourteen. We're in the freshman class. <laughs> we are. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing how time flies, and uh, I know the old the old joke. It's like uh, dog years in cannabis, right? Every every one year feels like seven, and it, it seems to be even accelerating yeah. at the the pace of news. But I don't know. Maybe we start with the the uh, the elephant in the room, Clubhouse. So we started the high rise on Clubhouse, and I'm not sure if you guys saw the news uh, from I believe Business Insider broke this news, but Clubhouse downloads for the month of April. Uh, we're 900,000, uh, which is, you know, a big number. But uh, in February, it was 9.6 million. So, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not uh, not saying there's a correlation, but, uh, you know, we're over here now doing a podcast and we're not on Clubhouse. Numbers plummeting. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to take the blame for, for the loss of uh, their audience. But, uh, you know, <laughs> the high rise we community. Yes. <laughs> not there anymore. It's difficult, too, because you have a lot of people talking about the same thing in different rooms. And I don't know, I kind of found it a little bit annoying because in the middle of the night, I get these bing and, you know, so and so's talking about a bong or whatever. And it's like, I, you know, I really want to sleep now. So like, and I know it's probably my fault because there probably are, um, you know, uh, you know, settings that I could work. Um, but I didn't. And <laughs> I just assume, you know, do it this way. It'll be interesting to see how it how it plays out. You know, I think the the debate right now is is Clubhouse a, a product and a service or is it more of a feature? You know, Twitter has their spaces and others have it, and I think there's a good a good use for it. And you know, these things this is the way it goes. But apparently, the retention numbers are good, so the people that are in there are sticking around. Um, and I'm sure you know I, we may be back uh, at a certain point as well. Kind of, I love the live um, nature of it, um, but the the challenge for us was just the the conversation goes away and we wanted to have a way to to archive it but we'll see how it goes still no android users still plenty of room to grow um but i just thought that was an interesting uh headline non cannabis related but just given that's where the high rise started i thought it would be interesting to call out but speaking of uh cannabis news let's start uh up in canada uh there's a few things that uh, kind of came up this week that I think are pretty interesting and worth covering. The first uh and actually wrote about this today, Sundial and Spirit Leaf or Inner Spirit Holdings. So Sundial made an acquisition of uh Spirit Leaf. Um you know the the interesting thing here is that Sundial is a is a brand. It produces a a set of brands in the markets, uh, you know, vapor pens and flower brands and I think some oil brands. And, um, you know, they raised a, a sizable amount of capital. I think they were on the brink for a moment there uh, for a while. Uh, but with this big capital raise that we kind of discussed around um, the Wall Street bets, traders coming through, coming in, um, you know, and buying the largest retailer by door count in Canada is an interesting model. And it's something that is uh, pretty unique to cannabis. When you think about CPG and the big CPG companies in in traditional verticals like Coca Cola or Frito Lay, you know, they're not buying retail chains and, and building out real real retail chains. They may have a direct to consumer play, but it's very different in in cannabis. And um, when you think about retailers and retailers getting into CPG, that seems to be a bit more common. You know, retailers with their private label products. Um, whether that's, you know, Costco and, and Kirkland brand or, you know, all the Trader Joe's brands, but you don't see Kirkland sold in other, other locations. And so, um, you know, kind of seeing that move, I think is pretty interesting, but I also think it's just a, a byproduct and a dynamic of the cannabis industry. We talked about Cure Leaf on a pre previous high rise and some of their CPG ambitions. And I, I believe it was Matt McGinley that said that that's the nature of 
just the way these licenses are rolling out in certain limited markets. Um, but in Canada, there's a bit more flexibility. So we think it's, uh, you know, just trying to get to scale, trying to get to size. I noticed that Sundial is not producing edibles or beverages yet. Do you think it would have been a better investment to, you know, invest in their brand portfolio? Or do you think having a retail footprint is the way to go? Is that going to be the model we'll see? You know, I think everything is evolving and firms are going out and seeing what sticks and seeing what, you know, consumers like best and how cost effective it is to roll out these products. But at the end of the day, like if you think about it, if you if you think about like, you know, Jim Beam, you know, whiskey or Patron Vodka, you know, they don't have like specific retail stores for that. Right. It's sold in wholesale. And, you know, eventually I think that's kind of how everything will work out. But right now, everything is restricted to how the laws are in each state. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that they're just trying to make some aggressive moves with the cash to establish a footprint, and then maybe they can fill in the products from there. Because I actually think that Cureleaf had established, you know, their flags across a wide reach in the United States, and then they they bought Select and, and kind of started backfilling on brands from there. And now they're very brand focused, clearly. Uh, but they also have done a really good job of planting flags in all of the key markets that they would want to be in. Maybe not all, but many. Um, so I think, I mean, I think like I mentioned last week, Sundial seemed to struggle operationally in their business, at least initially. So maybe they're just thinking if they've got the cash, go buy someone who's, who's actually achieved some scale and, and start there. Maybe they're just like, now we can start at a, at a higher point and run. So I think that right. might be a way to think about it. Yeah. Last week with Sundial, we were talking about their investing in a JV, like an investment arm to, to drive, um, you know, some, some investments and, and grow. And so this is, you know, more, more use of that, that cash that they're sitting on, um, which I believe is a fair amount. Yeah. And, and in California, you know, you see it, um, the parent company kind of took that model with Kaliva, you know, they've got retail, they've got their brands as well. I just wonder, you know, long-term, you know, if, if all the retailers are producing their own brands and distributing those brands to competitive retailers, you know, and they're competing on retail as well, does it start to look more like traditional um, CPG or does it, is it totally different? It's just a unique category, you know? And so it's, it's interesting to see, but it, it does seem like a pretty good bet. I mean, if I was Sundial now with this kind of access at retail, you could have, you know, Sundial products featured, you know, and uh, it can really drive more sales, build that relationship with customers that you couldn't without having that uh, retail footprint. But, um, you know, Canopy Growth has their tweed stores. And, you know, I know that um, Spirit Leaf sells tweed products. Uh, so it's kind of like, you know, Canopy is going to be competing on the retail with Sundial competing on the retail, but they both want their products in more stores. So maybe because of that, they just end up continuing to work together. Or maybe it becomes untenable, but interesting to kind of see that trend happening more and more, and especially this week with that news. Further news in Canada, a high tide um, in CBD. This is another thing we've talked about in the past. Um, you know, the, this, how do I get to America from Canada? And CBD seems to be the avenue, uh, whether it's Canopy Growth and, and, and Quattro, their Quattro brand in Southern Glazers, which is also pretty recent news. But high tide um, coming in with another CBD uh purchase uh brand purchase so is that are we just going to continue to see this going to be like a broken record pretty soon we'll be talking about this week over week i would say yes and i just think everybody's jockeying for their leadership position and seeing you know how best they can work the market and there are some risks to doing this because still at the end of the day we don't really know how cbd is going to be regulated so there could be all this effort in a product or products um, that may not be sustainable when the federal government comes in. I'm not saying that's going to be the case, but that's a risk. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, to your point, Cy, it's a way to reach into the U.S. It's a way to expand your footprint, get, maybe gain more customer data, see how products sell, different form factors. So, so yeah, so I think it's, I think we'll continue to see more and more of this, but I'm curious, you know, how many more CBD companies you could buy that are going to drive value. So, cause it's pretty, it's a tough, it's been a tough market because of exactly what Matt said, like the, the FDA's lack of true guidance has made it really difficult to, to operate. So anyway, I think it'll be interesting. 
Yeah, yeah, certainly something to watch uh, going forward. And it just uh, if we see federal legalization here, I'd imagine you know the the pace of acquisitions coming from Canada with some of the capital they're sitting on would be pretty extreme, given that they're you know purchasing brands in the CBD category. Um, also in Canada news, uh, I don't know if you guys caught this, the Organogram um, CEO has uh, left the building, um, you know, pretty recently. Permanently. Um, <laughs> yeah, permanently, it <laughs> sounds like. Um, he he came from Tilray. He was at Tilray prior to Organogram, and he made some news uh, maybe six weeks ago uh, about the BAT investment. Uh, so BAT doubled down or made that investment with Organogram, talking about creating an innovation facility, really talking about bringing some of their innovation on the beyond um, beyond nicotine programs that they're looking at, you know, vapor formats, things like that. So I thought it was. A uh, pretty big win for Organogram, kind of given their position in the market to attract someone like BAT to bring them in. Um, seemed like a good, a good thing. I, I don't have the context of of the departure, um, but you know he, he did come from Tilray to Organogram. Do you think we're going to see him pop up uh, at another LP soon? Do you think it has anything to do with the BAT investment? Well, didn't. Organogram really woof on their last um, earnings call. Um, so, you know, I kind of applaud the fact that, you know, it's like one strike and you're out. Maybe it was two strikes. I don't know. But, um, you know, it, it, it just goes, it's a testament to how the industry is evolving and it's becoming uh, more, um, you know, more professional. And, you know, these type of things don't, you know, they don't fly. You know, there was, how many quarters did Bruce Linton screw up, you know, before he was asked to leave? I mean, it was quite a lot, you know? So this is, you know, we're in the major leagues now, man. This is like, we're not JV anymore. So, you know, you gotta play accordingly. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, I mean, these guys seem to wash up on the shores of other co companies oh, after yeah. they depart. So I wouldn't be surprised if he shows up, you know, maybe, maybe shows up on a SPAC or he shows up on the board of a company or, back, and then back, he'll back, have like back. some, yeah, yeah. He'll have some kind of like crazy comp package. Um, kind of like you mentioned with Bruce Linton, you've seen him wash up on the shores of many companies. And so, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't feel like that there's a true merit based um, reward reward <laughs> system in our industry yet where excellence is, is getting people into positions where they, they get to create more value and, and derive value from the companies that they're getting involved in. I feel like it's just this person's been in cannabis, so maybe they should come over here and they won't be as bad as they were at the other. Yeah. They, they won't know. burn the whole house down this time, maybe just half the yeah. house or whatever, yeah. because like, look at Adam Bierman. He just like, basically he's, he's resurrected. He's, he's somewhere. I never would have thought like in any other industry that would have never happened. So he's back on, I don't really know in what capacity, uh, but the fact that I've read that, you know, he's back, um, you know, I don't know. Well, at least hopefully people know this time around, um, you know, what they're dealing with. Um, yeah. So. yeah, all, all good points. Well, speaking of, uh, Tilray, uh, the Tilray Afria, um, merger is a done deal. I know that took a little while longer. I think they had to lower the threshold for, um, for the vote count. And I think we touched on this in a previous high rise where it's just hard to get the retail investors to come to the table to, to sign, but it sounds like it's happening. Um, some of the headlines around that, there was a, a number of RSUs, I think, that were given to some senior senior people, but I guess they're now the largest cannabis company by uh, revenue. Does that still hold? Yeah, I believe so. And I think it's really exciting because, you know, they have a play into Israel, they have a play into Europe. You know, we're just starting to see what what's going to happen um, with them. You know, we're still so early on. Uh, but when you think about these strategic alliances and when the rest of the world is just starting to come on board, there's huge opportunity. You just got to make sure that you don't burn the house down on the way, you know, or sink the ship or hit the, you know, iceberg or whatever, however you want to call it along the way. But I think, you know, people, the investor base and the level of sophistication um, is in check now for the most part. So, yeah, I'm 
My uh, favorite tweet this week was this. <laughs> someone was like, are they going to call it tilapia now? <laughs> I, saw I just that. thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> um, I just, I love the Twitter verse around cannabis because there are some really funny people in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, we were early investors in Afria. Um, I still think they have some great assets and I do keep in touch with Carl, the COO over there. Um, I think he's a down to earth guy. You know, some people really ding him on the sweet, um, sweet, shoot, sweet What's water, the sweet water transaction. I, I don't necessarily, I mean, I, I, th- I do, you know, I poke fun at it sometimes cause I'm like, well, it's beer, but I, I get where they're going from. And like, to me, hops aren't that far different from cannabis because it's all kind of that same thing with terpenes and everything. So, so I don't think it's that much of a departure. And I think in, if it wasn't for the regulatory framework, we wouldn't have to have them so separated, but it is what it is. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm glad it, that they got it over the, I, I guess I'd call it now the starting line. So they got it over the starting line and they're right. this new business. And I'm curious to see um, how they're going to continue to try to, now that they've put it together, they've got to really drive their synergies and uh, make it worthwhile. So I'm curious to see how they do in executing on that. Yeah. And they, um, they didn't rebrand it to tilapia, unfortunately, <laughs> but they did uh, launch a new logo, which is basically the Afria, Afria logo mark brand mark with the Tilray word mark. Right. And just kind of color yeah. changes. And yeah. so, that, you know, that's interesting, but I, what I'm really waiting to see is kind of, what does the brand portfolio look like? Do they sunset some yeah. brands? Do they double down on other ones? You know, where do they start to invest, buy more beer companies? Yeah. I was a little sad to see the Afria ticker go away because it was one of the first tickers in our portfolio. So it was a little bit of like a bye-bye. <laughs> An era has ended. Just goes to show how, how old we are. Yeah. Old dusty here. Well, <laughs> and that was like the, the, uh, the uh, transaction with jazz pharmaceuticals and um, GW occurred this week. So Morgan and I were kind of like early guys in the portfolio. You're moving on and up like that's right going forward. So I had yeah. such a nice run in GW and I saw uh, I well could have sure if I had tomorrow's <laughs> paper today, I wouldn't be here right now. But I <laughs> good to know, know. Matt. <laughs> too too big for us at that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'd still be here. Just I would get my yacht somewhere doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, as we kind of wrap up some Canada news, uh, Chronos. So earnings season's you know coming up. A lot of stuff's coming uh, down the pipe here, and uh, Chronos announced some uh, a bit rough, I would say, on the earnings front. Um, what was it? It was down, I think, twenty percent sequentially uh, on a quarter over quarter basis. I was looking at the numbers. I think you know versus a year ago, um, they were up fifty percent. I think they you know it's twelve million versus eight. For the quarter, um, and I took a look at the market and looked at our our data here at Headset to see, you know, what was the quarterly growth for Canada in general, Q1 2020 versus Q1 2021, and it was about 90% growth for the market. So the market almost doubled. So they're they're certainly trailing um, market growth. I think they they called out some headwinds with the the pandemic, and you know, Canada mm-hmm. unfortunately has been really suffering with the the lockdowns. Um, you know, markets like Ontario, where you know 45% of the population live have really had it a uh, bit tough. And as those lockdowns happen, I think access has been limited. But um, just kind of a, a bummer uh, on the earnings. I, I, I know they announced some things like uh, moving into the edibles market. I think they said something like they're not the first, but they want to come in, you know, as the best. Um, so we'll see the uh, the brand. This is a flower brand of theirs, and I believe they make vapor pens as well. Spinach is their brand. So the edible brand is going to be also called Spinach. Um, certainly not resonating with the, the youth audience. So we don't have to worry about that. You know, kids, kids going after cannabis, um, when it's called spinach, but, uh, you know, we'll see how that impacts their, <laughs> their sales, right. How, how that impacts their sales longer term. Um, but yeah, any, any commentary on, on that? Is that what we're going to see with the other earnings coming forward? Is it something unique to Kronos? What do we have to expect there? Well, I mean, it was, what was just amazing is I think that they missed on every single line of business in terms of. Um, hitting their targets. And so that's, I mean, 
it's just dismal. Yeah, it is. It really is. And especially because they've got, the, you know, I just see like the companies that have gotten the biggest investments from outside of the industry are just, as Matt said, whiffing it. And it's like, all I can think about is if the capital had been directed into companies that are really executing, then this industry would look even better. But it is what it is. It's um, it's like the tech industry. You know, there's wave one and wave two, and maybe this is a pets.com situation, but, or maybe not. Maybe they pull it out with spinach and just really go to town. Um, maybe. I think it's like, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Matt. Well, I mean, I, it kind of feels like it's Altria's SPAC in a way. Like, I'm just wondering if they're waiting to just use the money to just buy something um, to save the day. And maybe that they're just waiting for legalization so they can keep their listing and and just do something or a change in, in you know, our federal situation. But um, that's what it feels like to me. For sure. They're going down the tobacco path. Um, but the thing with, with um, Kronos, so th this is a good example of um, a company that's way back when we talk about going way back because they were one of the first uh, that out of the gate that went public. You know, we didn't have a lot of the folks that we have now. And there was just limited amount. Nobody kind of knew what was going on. And they had some semi-credible people. And, you know, things just started taking a turn. And then you had the oversupply and more and more, you know, um, builds and so forth. Um, I think, um, well, first of all, in terms of net income and, and, and the wolf on the earnings, I think that's pathetic because if you compare Canada to the U.S., we have such a high cost of prohibition here, not just 280E, but just as I've talked about a lot of times, um, you know, just everything, compliance, um, you know, whatever it is, the list can go on and on. Uh, they don't really have that. I mean, maybe it costs a little bit more money to grow and their costs are operating costs, maybe, but so in parts of the U.S. too, we have that. Um, so I don't know. I just, when you stack it against the U.S., that's just kind of pathetic. But the silver lining could be, um, so as they enter into, um, you know, the edibles and, and so forth, as the price of flour comes down, that raw material um, is is um, less. So their margin should expand if, in fact, um, there is widespread acceptance of their products. So that could help them. Um, but I don't know. I'm just sticking to the U.S., man. I'm just. Yeah. <laughs> That's where my money is. Never, what did Warren say? Never bet against America. Right, exactly. And that's what bothers me so much because like we should be freaking crushing it. We should be the supplier of the world. And, you know, uh, and everybody has a head start. Like, you know, Constellation is a U.S. company, but they it put their money in Canada. That money should have been put in the U.S. I don't mean to sound like a Jerry Seinfeld here, but it's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. And hopefully um, that will be the case sooner, sooner than later. Uh, fingers <laughs> crossed. Those, so speaking of U.S., let's let's move out of Canada, come back uh, across the border, back into the U.S. here. So last week we talked about Ascend uh, going public, listing on the uh, Canadian <coughs> exchanges, but an American company. Um, how how is all that looking? How did it go? Emily, I know, you, you know, you're an early investor in Ascend and, um, you know, that was some big news. Also, I believe they opened a Boston uh, store or it's opening, uh, which is yeah. huge, uh, huge news. So I'm sure every, it's, it's all smiles over there. Um, but how, how are things looking? Well, I mean, it is, but it is. I mean, so to your exact point about kind of the the accessibility and, and the easiness of being a, can a U.S. cannabis company in a public market. So the way the process works is we had to get onto the CSE first, and then we're trying to get the OTC done, which Gage is also going through, because mm -hmm. that would increase exposure and access to the stock. But instead, we're just sitting in very low liquidity on the CSE. So the stock has kind of like went. And actually, I mean, I have to be honest, like as an investor, I'm much happier if the stock just builds. I want the start the chart to build. I don't want it to be like this whipsaw action where it opens at 20 and draws down to seven and then we bounce up to 12. But so we've been kind of bouncing around nine nine bucks Canadian, nine to 975 Canadian all week. Um, but I think like Morgan said that every single share was there was like nothing to trade today because like every share is like spoken for. So we've got to get uh, more float. We've got to get more access to more investors. So, and I know 
I know I'm so excited for the Twitter guys, all the big MSO gang people to get access to it because I know they want it and they want access to mm -hmm. these other companies. So, um, so it's been, it's just tough. It's different um, being a public U.S. Ca a cannabis company. The, the actual mechanics of it don't function like a normal public company. Um, but yeah, I would say I'm very happy with how it ended up. I'm very happy. We have a stock chart that's building. Um, I'm excited about the um, Boston location. I'm excited about how they went about the listing process, doing a full U.S. prospectus um, filing, which is an arduous process. It took them months and months and months and a lot of hard work. Um, and we did the gap financials, audited financials. We did everything so that, you know, Abner is a very savvy guy. He ran a really successful hedge fund. He came from Bauhaus, which is also an incredibly well-recognized group. Um, so he knows, he understands what you want to do to set it up to attract good investors. And so that's that's really what I would say Ascend has really focused on in this process. And I think they achieved it. I think we just, we're just, you know, dealing with the challenges of being a cannabis public, public cannabis company in the US. So, but I think it's good. I'm excited. Yeah. Mm. I'm really excited, um, but you mm -hmm. know what I also think is cool is that the new regime or the new group of um, companies that have emerged in you know this year and toward the end of last year, like they know what they don't know, right? So they're gonna right. get the best growers, or they're gonna find out what you know. They're smart enough to know that. Whereas if you look the other way, it's like, ooh, what? Oh, ooh, IR? Ooh, I didn't know how to manage street expectations. I didn't know any of that. So it was a really big cluster, blankety blank, um, out of the gate, you know, because the, nobody knew how to manage these things, the street, the street. And then you had analysts stepping in, and, and, and some were better than others, and some didn't really think through sort of the message that was coming across. So I don't know. It's... It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do think like having, so we're, we've got the Friend Street location that's opening. Well, it opened, but we're doing the grand opening next week. It's going to be incredible. It's right by the Boston Garden. It's huge. It's beautiful. Oh. Um, they, they did a lot of community development there. Our CEO of Ascend Mass, Andrea Cabral, she's an incredible human being. She was the sheriff of Suffolk County at one point, oh, wow. which is, she's a trailblazer. She's unbelievable. And so... And that's cool too that we had our you know the first ceo of any entity within ascend was uh of a state because you know all these things have different entities because of cannabis and uh but it's cool that it was a female um so i you know i thought that was really she's an absolute powerhouse so so i'm excited for that store i can't wait to go check it out um and i think they're going to do some really cool to your point sai about products they're going to have like different um brand experiences because they have such a impressive footprint so different floors will have different experience it's a multi-floor store too it's going to be i can't wait to see it because this is the first thing i saw when we were investing in ascent and i was like that's an ambitious task we got other markets open first before we got this thing open but um you know the first floor i think will be for more of the products that p tend to get purchased very frequently so i'm sure they'll be using their headset data to help to drive how they're productizing the store but um, then they'll have brand experiences and brand um, pop-up shops. And so it's going to be a really cool consumer product experience within in the four walls of that operation. I want to get in my car now and go up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty neat. I can do the same. It would just take me a few days. Uh, from the <laughs> just a few days, yeah. Um, but it's tempting. So, so speaking yeah. of public markets, you know, some news this week, uh, Credit Swiss. Uh, pulled the plug on executing cannabis trades and oh the God. custodial function as well. And um, I'm not sure their reach as far as, you know, the custodial function versus just trades, like if they're providing that for a lot of, you know, kind of retail traders out there. But uh, did we see an impact? Are we are we going to expect to see an impact? Are we going to expect to see others? Like just like what you're saying, Emily, I mean, you know, being on the CSE and not a lot of, of floats, you know, not a lot of liquidity there. Um, you know, you want to get it on the OTC, get more traders buying and selling and now you have credit swiss pulling the plug um what the hell like why did this happen and uh what's what do we need to expect here well one observation is i don't know if you guys remember but in october 2019 um bank of new york um mellon did the same thing they mm -hmm. said no no more right so yeah i, I looked at the 
you know, but the game was different then, right? You know, you didn't have an ascendant on, you know, in play. You had GTI and some of these other winners, but, you know, it was early on, right? So there wasn't as much excitement around these names. I mean, GTI back then was like, I think seven bucks. But $7, when I looked at the, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so when I looked at like, you know, how did the stocks react to that news? It was like a little blip. Like now it's much more profound. Um, but, and I think who else was it? Um, oh gosh, the name escapes me. It'll come back to me as soon as we hang up. But, um, you know, I think there was another firm that could put the kibosh on the execution. Um, you know, it sucks. My only guess is like, well, first of all, okay, why now? Like, why are you doing this yeah. now? <laughs> so there's probably like somebody who, there's something going on, some person, some head of something. There's there's a personal thing involved. There's got to be. There always is. When things take a turn, all of a sudden, um, you know, and it, it kind of reminds me now, you know, well, a couple things. Um, I think um, we we're going to talk about the SEC. And the SEC now has some guidance around warrants for SPACs. Okay, like why? Like so they want to record. Well, they want to record um, the warrants. Have companies uh, SPACs record warrants as a liability versus equity? Okay, why? Why? <laughs> SPACs have been going on for how many years? So my take on that is it's a way. There's been you know the SEC is coming down on SPACs unfairly and i think this is a passive aggressive way to put the brakes on because it's a pain in the ass what they're going to require so you know it remains to be seen but that's my take on, on on that and it's similar to what um jeff's um uh bar attorney bar did with the, with the industry as a whole you know he knew he couldn't shut the industry down so what did he do He's, he instituted these um, antitrust reviews of many of the mso's to distract them, to consume money, to consume time, um, that went really nowhere. But the ploy was, oh well, gee, you know, maybe if I screw them up, the industry will shut down or slow down. That's my perception. So everything's driven by, you know, a decision from somebody for whatever re personal reason. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think this may have had a bigger impact in April than people realize, because from what I understand, they did have some institutions on the platform that had pretty significant dollars at work in the industry, and they were forced to sell out before April 30th. So, you know, you started to see the stocks lift a little bit in the beginning of the month, and it was like April 20th should have been, I mean, cannabis was flying out the doors and the market was just absolutely inverting. So I can't help but think like, I've, you know, there are rumors that like Wasatch, they were a big investor relative to our industry. Like that's an institution. That's a very well known institution. And I, from what I understand, it's some groups like that that had to completely get their, get it out of there um, because of Credit wow. Suisse. So I think it's because Credit Suisse blew themselves up on that other thing too. So this could have been like a bigger credit Swiss issue. And they were like, just, it, it only takes one risk guy. And I say guy because a lot of the time it's a guy, but um, <laughs> that'll like shut the whole thing down. Like that's how we lost our very first bank account was I, we got defrauded. Someone wrote checks, uh, you know, I, I have to mail in checks to the state governments and do filings and someone ripped off our checks. It was the most ridiculous um, job I've ever seen too. Cause I saw the photocopies of the fake checks. And that got us, you know, we got raised to a risk, even though they knew what we were doing, some new risk person looked at us and decided you're out. And that's the first bank account we lost of many, um, even as a fund. So anyway, I, that was enormously disappointing to me, this whole thing. Cause I just feel like how, to Matt's exact point, like how are we going backwards right now? How are we going backwards right now? Yep. Yeah, but you wonder been here before. Whoever sitting around making these decisions i mean are they not reading the newspaper do they not know that there's going to be changes at the federal level that more states are legalizing like where do they think the risk is now they're obviously they... not listening to this podcast they're not <laughs> and you know what yeah. i am going next time i'm in the city i am going to one of these banks and I'm, I'm... somebody <laughs> listens so anyway <laughs> Well, you mentioned GTI. Uh, GTI made a couple of headlines. Uh, again, every week, so many headlines. But, uh, you know, this one is money-related, uh, new senior debt uh, financing. 
which, you know, you can't go to the capital markets or the public markets. Maybe there's some debt financing available. But what I think was interesting, it was about a little over $200 million. Um, but I think the interest is uh, surprisingly low for, you know, cannabis operator at about 7%, um, which is a great, great sign. Obviously, you know, they've, they've built a sizable business and a real, you know, um, a great business. And I'm sure that helps with that number. But is this, you know, the new kind of benchmark? Is it uh, less risky for banks? Are we going to start seeing lower rates kind of going forward from debt facilities? I, I think it's going to depend on the quality of the company. And if you recall from last week, I did the analysis where I um, showed the cash flow relative to, um, you know, uh, the, the tax liability or the, the current provision. And the companies that are in that circle have the cash, right? And I think those, that's the bullseye of, I think those are going to benefit from a refinancing at a lower rate. And it's not surprising to me that GTI was able to get a lower rate. Uh, their, their cash flow is way in excess of, you know, um, their, their tax liability, which is, we talked about, you know, 70, 80%. And they're still, you know, dealing in, with the headwinds of the added cost of prohibition. So it's remarkable. It really is remarkable. And um, when prohibition ends, it, it's even that much more attractive. So I don't know if I was a lender, I'd be hell yeah. You know, this industry is is on fire. There's so much more growth, and the numbers speak for themselves. And and they have real auditing firms too. I mean, one of my criticisms of sort of, you know, when I go through all these things, guys, I used to be an auditor and like Louie Dewey and Screwy Audit Firm, they don't really have like some of the footnotes, some of the things don't like add up, right? If you're an accountant, you got to make sure one and one equals two. Okay. I mean, that's a pretty you hope so. basic. So. And then you know, going through this, I'm like, why doesn't this equal whatever, you know? So that's why I have less hair now, I think. But um, anyway, so it's not surprising, and I think there's going to be the elite class of the MSOs that will probably be able to refinance at that at that rate. Not everybody, obviously. Uh, it'd be interesting when credit agencies come in and, and rate the debt. You know, we haven't seen that like yet in cannabis. And um, the only thing that sucks, uh, but it's it's pretty beat. But like you can't deduct the interest expense under 280E. So even though it's seven percent, you know, it's not like it's you know usually it's you know, the rate less one minus T when you do your cost of capital, but whatever, it's still better than 15% or whatever it is. I think acreage actually did like 18% or something like that. And it was like a three month note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was really scary. Um, yeah, no, I mean, Ben has, Ben Kobler has been, as long as we've been investors in GTI, he's always been focused on how do we reduce the cost of capital in our business? How do we improve that aspect of our operations. And so one of the things they've tried to do too is hold on to assets so that they can get leverage in different ways. And so it's a lot of the MSOs do sell leasebacks, sell leasebacks, sell leaseback, and they do too, but they like to hold on to as much real estate as they can to use that to help to securitize any further lending that they can do. And so I think that helps you to get a lower rate too. But one of the things I think that was super smart that they did, and it shows me where they're thinking is well so they did it and there were some warrants attached to it um just to point that out so there was a little juice to it for people who participated but and which was smart because their stock is a good stock and it's worth doing that but um the the thing i thought was super smart is that it has like a one-year timeline and like no prepayment penalty after that so my feeling on this is that these guys are thinking it's going to get even better than seven percent like we're we're just going to keep going down if we keep doing what we're doing and the the people with the lowest cost of capital, their capital goes further, their shareholder value is just improved. And I just think it's critical to growing these businesses truly eff efficiently and effectively. So, Yeah, well, they're going to need the capital because uh, the next bit of news out of the U.S. is Virginia's heating up. And uh, GTI made some bets uh, there. Uh, I believe they announced acquisition mm -hmm. of Dharma, one of the limited licenses that exists. Um, Virginia is is pretty unique, I would say. Um, you know, recently, I believe it was back in March, um, they passed some sort of compromise to legalize recreational cannabis, uh, one of the first in the South. Um, mm -hmm. But they set a launch date of 2024, 
which is uh, <laughs> that's a weird. Prohibition would totally be over by then. I don't know. Yes, <laughs> maybe that's what they're hoping for. But yeah. Um, but uh, more recently, um, their House Speaker said that she will support a measure to legalize adult use of marijuana uh, J- July first, instead of waiting nearly three years. And um, this was echoed um, amongst others in the government. So it sounds like things might be moving faster uh, than than 2024. And, you know, seeing some of the activity, whether that's GTI uh, jumping into that market, uh, Jushi also betting big. Mm-hmm. When I kind of looked at the the operators in in the market, it's very much um, Pennsylvania. It's like the same the same crew, the same crew from Pennsylvania rolling rolling deep into the south there. So. Um, you know, what do we think? I, I know MJ Biz has some projections, probably based on population. They said uh, first full year, probably five hundred million dollars in sales, and by its fifth year, one point four billion, which um, you know sounds reasonable. Um, just another example, another limited license market looks and smells like Pennsylvania. Let's go here and let's let's jump in and hope that it starts uh, adult use before twenty twenty four. You know, you know what's interesting. One of my observations around this is where we are now. So things are percolating pretty quickly, and and um, you know, back in the day, you know, everybody went you know gun for the New York license. The smarter people, I think, sort of stayed on the sidelines, knowing it was going to be a long time before you know rec would be passed, and they're bleeding cash. Nobody, I think, they you know bled a lot of money in, in especially in Manhattan. Columbia Care, you know, there's really no market. It's expensive and so forth. But now what we're seeing, it's like, okay, medical, boom, quickly we have the rec market. So you don't have that gap. So your return on investment is, you know, obviously going to be a lot more uh, favorable now. And the companies that are stepping in and getting medical and then converting to or, you know, gunning for the rec uh, versus, you know, some of these earlier states. Um, so it sort of underscores, um, you know, sort of the competency or the prowess or whatever you want to call it of, of some of the, um, the, the newer guys. That's just my two cents on that. I just think it's an exciting market. It's adjacent to other interesting markets. Um, we looked at assets in Virginia for some of our other companies. And I think just to share one point of view is that as an investor, I am we are looking at opportunities where we're, we are playing into these kind of single state baskets so that we are thinking about acquisition strategies as they go. So if there's a market that we really like, we're looking for companies just like what GTI just acquired and what um, Juchi acquired. So it's just an interesting time to be an investor into those markets as they're opening and kind of trying to decide what your timeline is till something like that happens. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see uh, how Virginia pans out, um, you know, and hopefully something before 2024. Well, I think that'll do it uh, for this uh, week. Anything you guys want to share um, upcoming? Yeah, I mean, I'll just jump in. So Poseidon just launched its third fund in the beginning of March. We already had our first close and we're going to be deploying capital into our first two companies. Um, so really good things happening there. We're very excited. So we are still raising the money. It's going to be a $50 million fund. Um And it's post-seed stage, which we're excited to be kind of moving back to the earlier stages of companies again. So I'm happy to talk more about that in the future, especially after we've invested in some of the capital on it. But it's a pretty exciting strategy. Yeah, uh, March, uh, March, May 17th, we're hosting um, a, a, a webinar, a SPAC webinar, Can a SPAC Outperform? And we're going to have three, maybe four sponsors. Um, right now, we have um, Jamie Mandela from um, from Air and from Glasshouse, and we have uh, Choice Consolidation, and then we have Ruth Epstein with um, uh, BGP, BGP Partners. So we're excited, and I think it's going to be very informative because we're going to be analyzing a lot of things I think that nobody's really talked about um, and then hopefully I'll have my research paper um, ahead of the call or around the final call so there'll be um, you know some more information for, for folks we're going to be launching at some point I having difficulties with a web site right now but uh, a, a specific SPAC research for cannabis and um, yeah excited. Very cool. Well, thank you both uh, for joining. And uh, this is turning into my favorite uh, day of the week. So looking forward to doing this again next week. We'll see you then. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff.
All right. Thank Cheers. Thank you.